Hello, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, property verification in uh, synchronous data flow graphs uh, with a focus on the consistency property. So, um, the context of this work, uh, we were working on a project on uh, cyber physical systems, uh, specifically uh, autonomous driving in uh, cars and uh, assistance to drivers. So, um, in those cyber physical systems, you have real-time oriented uh, physical interfaces, which will have uh, real-time constraints, and uh, more data-oriented computation kernels uh, that are going to uh, start computing as soon as input is available. And uh, there is a regular data flow between the components. So, uh, in the small example on the slide, you can see uh, some, uh, some system with three sensors, uh, each with their own uh, frequency specifications, and uh, display in the cockpit of the car and a uh, fusion uh, computation kernel in the middle, whose job is to draw uh, results from the uh, other sensors on the frame uh, sensed by the camera. Um, and so what we uh, wanted to do was to uh, make performance prediction on uh, this kind of system, so to analyze their throughput, so how many times uh, some uh, functions are going to work over a certain amount of time, uh, the latency, that is the time between uh, the sensing and uh, when the result is displayed on the screen, and uh, memory footprint, uh, which is how much memory do I need to store intermediate results in my uh, computation? So uh, there is a lot of background on this subject. Uh, so uh, we used data flow models of computation. Uh, so they define static asynchronous rules uh, to make the functions communicate together. And uh, it allows a static determination of uh, periodic scheduling properties, so namely uh, consistency and liveness. Um, the consistency is a property uh, that, uh, if asserted, uh, guarantees that you have a bounded size for the communication channels in your graph, even if you repeat your schedule infinitely often. And uh, the liveness is, uh, establishes the fact that you have non-blocking communications in your system. So these two properties are prerequisites to make a uh, performance analysis on a uh, data flow graph. Uh, so there is also an extensive uh, literature on the subject. And uh, one interesting aspect uh, is uh, the composition and uh, hierarchic refinement in the data flow graphs. Uh, which is basically uh, replacing an, uh, some function in your system by a more refined version, uh, which allows you to detail how uh, parallel your uh, tasks are going to be inside this composite actor. Um, and then you can make uh, modular uh, scheduling and performance analysis of your system, uh, which is always a good thing uh, to do. Uh, so, in, in the existing works, uh, the verification of the consistency and liveness properties are just discarded as, uh, well, trivial, so it's not really hard, but uh, we believe that it was interesting to look into it. Uh, so, what we wanted to do was to make an incremental property verification of uh, consistency and liveness. Uh, for the scalability and also to enable us to make some design assistance in the process of modeling your system. So uh, in the talk, I will only be considering the consistency property. And uh, so I'm going to uh, sum up what we did in our work. So we proposed an incremental consistency check for synchronous data flow graphs by expressing uh, local minimal solutions in uh, the problem and then incrementally combining the local solutions to go towards uh, the solution if it exists. Uh, so we also made a complexity analysis and experimental verifications uh, for our approach. So we worked on uh, worst case uh, graphs and on average graphs that uh, we defined using typical parallel patterns in synchronous data flow graphs. And uh, we made a comparison of our approach in a monolithic way, which is basically applying our algorithm uh, 
just as the existing algorithms are applied, just to compare in the usual way they're used. And then uh, we made experiments with a modular approach, uh, gradually building an application with uh, modules. So uh, synchronous data flow graphs, uh, they are composed of actors which model the functions in your system. So here you can see uh, the, the functions of the small example I showed on the first slide. Um, so uh, each function is represented by an actor which models the computation. And they are connected by uh, channels. Uh, they are directed arcs between the, the functions. And uh, so the uh, important thing to say is that these channels are read blocking, which means that when a function is trying to read uh, data from a channel, it will block until the input requirement is satisfied. Uh, and uh, the measurement of how much data is available on a channel is measured in uh, tokens. And so when firing, an actor will produce and consume tokens on the channels it's connected to. So this is represented basically by a directed graph. And uh, this looks uh, really much like a CAN process network. <clears throat> so in which you have uh, determinate communications, but you cannot decide if uh, the size of your channels is bounded for an infinite reputation of a periodic schedule. So that's where the SDF uh, rates uh, enter in, uh, in action. So an, a rate in a synchronous data flow, it's a natural integer, uh, strictly positive, that you assign to an actor on a channel. And uh, at every firing, the actor will produce and consume that specified number of tokens. So what ba basically what it does is that it introduces linearity in the behavior of the system and it allows to decide if there is a bound on the channel size. So how do we do that? We uh, put the rates together in a matrix. So you can see on the top right of the screen uh, the matrix for the graph uh, that we have here. So there is one column per actor and one row per channel. And uh, one column gives for one given actor its rates on the channel. So if I take, for example, my fusion actor, which is labeled as the fourth actor, it is connected to all the channels. And I can see uh, its rates on the fourth uh, column. Uh, then I can specify a periodic schedule using a column vector with one row per actor and uh, each entry tells how many times the actor fires in one repetition of uh, the periodic schedule. So in my example, I will say that my fusion actor fires once in my uh, periodic schedule. And now I can make the product of my matrix and my scheduling vector and get the result, giving me uh, the difference in number of tokens on all my channels after that firing. So. Here, obviously, if I repeat this schedule infinitely, I'm going to have uh, deadlock and uh, memory problems. So I can now state my consistency condition, uh, which is uh, that there is a non-trivial solution to uh, the system of equations defined by my uh, matrix. Uh, so that means that basically the number of tokens is the same in the system after each repetition of my schedule. And so the size of uh, my channels is bounded by the maximum it can reach in this periodic schedule. So um, the shape of the matrix uh, gives us some interesting properties that there is a minimal solution to this problem. So for the static analysis, it's interesting because we're just going to consider the smallest uh, repetition and then make extrapolations on a long run repetition of that schedule. And also that all the vectors that are in the null space of my matrix are multiples of this uh, minimal vector. So on my example, uh, I have this minimal uh, solution. And I know that uh, any periodic schedule that is consistent will see a multiple of the number of firings that's given in this uh, vector. So now uh, the existing approach is to take the whole graph and uh, make uh, this verification on the whole graph. Uh, what we wanted to do was to have a more uh, modular approach, and so we considered uh, the composition of uh, data flow graphs. So now I'm going to detail uh, elementary composition operators uh, based on which we defined 
our uh, composition operators for, our, for the graph. So uh, by convention, we assume that when there is only one actor and it, it's not connected to any other actor, it has a minimal repetition vector of one, which is logical since uh, I want to fire my actor at least once and I want my channels to have the same state. I have no channels, so okay. I fire it once and it's my minimal repetition vector. Uh, know what happens if one output of A is required by B as an input. So I'm going to uh, connect my actors and define the static rates and it defines a local consistency equation. So which is quite simple, I want to fire my actor a certain number of times and I must fire the other actor the right number of times so that the number of tokens produced and consumed is balanced. So obviously, if I just make a ratio of uh, my two uh, x variables, I get, um, I get a fraction. Here it's uh, six quarters. And of course, if I want the minimal solution, I just compute the GCD of uh, these numbers and I get the irreducible fraction that gives me the minimal solution to this local consistency equation. So now I can just say that my repetition vector for my new graph is uh, three and two, and here I wrote it as a multiplication of my first vector and of the second vector, um, because it's what it's going to happen when I have a more complex graph, as I show on the next slide. So here, basically, I'm just exploring the null space of my first matrix and the null space of my second matrix, find the appropriate vectors, and define one vector from these two vectors. So uh, on the left, I have that solution that I found by connecting A and B. And the next step, uh, I want to connect an output of B to an input of C. So in that case, I also have a local consistency equation. And so I find my solution and I, I realize that my repetition factor for B is not the same uh, in the existing solution prime and my local consistency equation. So in that case, that's not a problem because, as I said, I'm going to explore my uh, null spaces in my two graphs in order to find uh, adjustment factors for uh, the existing solution. So uh, basically, uh, it's given by the equations here, but the, uh, the goal is to find a factor that I can apply to each vector so that the concatenation is a solution to my new uh, global system. So in that case, uh, I make a cross product of my fractions and I get the equation on, uh, on the bottom and that gives me uh, three by one, that's three, I must multiply x prime by three and uh, two by two, I have to multiply my vector x second uh, by four and it's my new minimal solution. So I can repeat this incrementally and uh, I will get a connected graph uh, in the end and so the last uh, question is what happens if I'm connecting two actors in one connected component. So in that case, uh, I'm going to uh, have my local consistency equation just the same. And uh, I realize that uh, I cannot find two factors because I have only one vector to multiply. So in the end, in this situation, um, the solution to my consistency equation must be uh, covered by the existing solution, otherwise my consistency check fails and I decide that this additional channel uh, breaks the consistency property in my new graph. So of course in that case my adjustment factors are just one and in the end this operation is not needed. So that's a small optimization of what's happening in the global verification. We remove uh, many operations, as we will see in our experimental uh, verification. So what we did was to integrate uh, basically those basic steps in, uh, in an open source tool uh, handling uh, synchronous data flow graphs. So it's a C++ uh, tool suite, and um, it already includes a random generation of synchronous data flow graphs and uh, the typical existing monolithic consistency check. So we generated three benchmarks uh, to see different things on, uh, on our algorithm. So the first benchmark uh, is composed of complete and uh, homogeneous synchronous data flow graphs. 
So we chose complete graphs because in our case, uh, it is the worst case. Uh, we have the maximum number of balanced equations for the number of actors that we're considering. And uh, homogeneous means that all the rates are one in the graph. Uh, so this has the uh, advantageous side effect to remove the GCD operations in our algorithm, which makes it much more stable because with random rates, uh, otherwise our measures would uh, fluctuate a lot. And so we generated uh, just 10 graphs ranging from 100 to 1,000 actors, and uh, it was sufficient to observe what we wanted, so we stopped there. Um, the second benchmark is also complete graphs to explore our worst case, but this time with rates randomly generated, so we are going to see some variations, and uh, we wanted to see how it went. So there we generated uh, much more graphs, uh, 3,000 graphs uh, with 100 versions of each size, ranging from 10 to 300. So this was a very long process because uh, generating uh, consistent graphs is uh, complicated. And uh, the third benchmark uh, is uh, SDF graphs with an average degree of four per actor. So um, we chose this average degree because it corresponds to uh, cascaded split joint patterns in uh, your graph. So uh, a split joint pattern is when you will have an actor um, distributing tokens to several parallel actors and then the results of these actors are joined in a third actor. So it's a typical parallel pattern that you can see in these graphs. It's basically uh, SIMD uh, parallelism. And uh, so we use the same parameters as in benchmark two. So we experimented on a basic workstation, uh, nothing uh, fancy here. So our first experiment uh, shows that uh, on the worst case, and uh, when we don't have GCDs, we have nice uh, stable curves. Uh, we also made a complexity analysis, so uh, the polynomial is given with dashed, uh, dashed uh, line. And uh, well, in this case, and for this implementation, our algorithm uh, followed that line. And so uh, by making a difference with uh, the, um, the curve for the existing algorithm, we realized that we were at about one order of magnitude uh, better. So even on a monolithic check, uh, our approach uh, performs better. So uh, in the case of the first, second, and third benchmark, so complete graphs on the left and uh, average degree four on the right, uh, we can see that it's also the case, and of course the gap is uh, reduced when we have uh, more practical graphs. We can also see that there is a lot of variation in the computation time. And so in the end, the experiment that we really wanted to conduct was uh, this one, uh, making composition of a graph from several modules. So we have 30 modules of 10 actors each and we incrementally compose the application uh, of 300 actors by connecting these modules together. And so we have two strategies to check the consistency property. The first one is a monolithic check using our algorithm uh, uh, at each step on the module of size number steps uh, by uh, 10 actors. And the second strategy is using our algorithm but just making the required verification on, on the graph and we can see that it's a much more uh, scalable approach. So to uh, wrap up on, uh, on this uh, talk and uh, our contribution, so we proposed an incremental consistency check of synchronous data flow graphs, uh, which is well an alternative to making a check on whole, the whole graph uh, at every step of the design. So uh, it's obviously much more scalable, and uh, our experimental evaluation validated our approach. So uh, the next steps are to extend this approach to more expressive data flow models like uh, Polygraph, uh, in which you have much more parameters to the consistency problem. Uh, we also want to apply the same kind of approach to the, the verification of liveness uh, property, uh, which is uh, a harder nut to crack. And we want to infer the rates to achieve consistency on new connections uh, because when the designer is going to um, build his model sometimes, um, <clears throat> some 
modules won't be compatible uh, from scratch, and you're going to want to adjust the rates on these modules so that they can work together. And so with a uh, local consistency check approach, we can infer uh, the appropriate rates to uh, achieve consistency. Thank you for introduction. Hello, everyone. Now I will present our work, Concrete Data in Heap Mobility Program. So first, I hope we all agree that simulate and concrete execution are popular approaches to generate text input for program with primitive variable. For example, with this, this code, it's easy to generate text input with 100% range coverage using simulate or concrete execution. But the problem is when apply this technique to help my building program, sorry, but there are still many open problems that need to solve. So in previous work, people apply a technique called lazy initialization to perform symbolic execution on hip mobility program. The general idea of lazy initialization is like this. When a driven variable or field is accepted, it will be initialized with a now value or a new object or an existing object of the same time. So for example, if we have a relevant variable header of time not when header is set, it will be initialized to a value now or to a new not. And now suppose that the not has a few net which has the same time, continue with this situation when header.net is accept, it will again initialize to now to a new node and it can bond back to the header. And then the execution list by on DG, DKC. So the strong point of the initialization is it can generate uh, on possible test input structure. But the weak point if the input need to satisfy some time of constraint, for example, here. If we require that header is a pointer to a single clean list, that the initialization may generate some invalid structure, such as this one. I hope we all agree this is not a single clean list, right? So um, that is the first limitation of that the initialization. It may generate uh, the data structure that violates the routine. For the second limitation, if a relevant variable or field is never set in the execution, it will never be initialized. For an example, consider a doubly linked list. If we have a method under test that travel the linked list through the next field, the reverse field are never set, and then they are never be initialized. So in the end, we may have partially initialized test input. There are several um, proposals to solve this problem. For example, we have has. This is a specification based that This is a specification language that can model the property of data structure. And the idea is in the middle of execution, whenever a new test input structure is created, it will be checked with has specification and if it violates the specification, we can remove the input structure and continue to it law with the new one. The problem is has is not expressive enough. For example, it cannot model the arithmetic constraint, and so it cannot model some properties such as sortedness or balance in some type of data structure. So in this work, we propose a new approach to generate test input for heap mobility program. Our approach is based on separation logic. So the general idea is we will yield the separation logic to model the three condition of method under threat. And then we generate test input according to this three condition. So with the three condition, we guarantee that on our test input are valid. And the second one is on the field are initialized. So in the end, we have fully initialized test input. So first, the question is, what is separation logic? So separation logic is an extension of whole logic to model the heap of the program. 
Separation lucid has some new predicate, such as empty predicate to model an empty heap. It has bond to predicate to model a situation in which we have a variable H that bond to a node of type C in the heap. And it also has a separating conjunction operator star here to model the situation in which the heap can be divided into two separable regions. One reason satisfies P and the other reason satisfies Q. Especially, separation logic support user to define inductive predicate. We can model many types of data structure. For example, here we have a definition for a single lean list. So, in the definition, we have two cases. In the first case, we have an empty heap and header in this case equal to now. In the second case, had the bond to a node, and the next field of, of the node is constrained by single linear predicate again. And this is separable from the node of the header. With this definition, when header is set, we have these two cases. You see that? It's a same analogy initialization, right? But when header.net is set, we only have two cases also. Because net here constrained by CLILILIT and it's only two cases. So we will never generate an invalid structure in which header.net bond back to header. So that's it, the general idea. And based on this idea, we develop an approach to generate testing boot for heap mobility program with two steps. In this presentation, I will give this as a motivation example. So this is just a simple remove method for a binary subtree. To generate the um, test input for this method, yeah, here, this it here. We need a valid binary subtree for the root field here, and we need a value for parameter S here. So we need to generate two values. Uh, this is just a back of code uh, for the full version. You can refer to the paper. So first, first step, we need a recondition in form of separation logic, and this is the definition for the binary search tree. Again, we have two cases. In the first case, we have an empty heap, and root equal to now. In the second case, root bound to a node. This is the arithmetic constraint for the element value of the root. And this is the constraint for the left field and the right field. So you see that the left field and the right field are the left subtree and right subtree of the binary tree here. And notice that we update the bound here for the left subtree and right subtree. So we currently the sorted net property of binary subtree predicate. And with this predicate, now we are ready for the first step of our approach with a specification by setting. So in this step, we generate test input in a light box manner. We do not care about the program under set yet, but we only yield the recondition. So we unfold the recondition up to a predefined depth. Can be one, two, three, um, it's based on your, your definition. And then we pass the unfolded formula to a server. In this work, we use a specific server called h 2 so this server can understand the formula in form of separation logic and can return the model in case the formula is satisfiable. And if we have the model, we then transform the model into test input. So that's a general idea in this step. For an example, now suppose that we unfold the recognition just one time, we will get the two formula based on its definition. The first formula root equal to now, the second formula root one to a node, and this is the left subtree, right subtree, and this is the arithmetic constraint. If we want, we can unfold more. For example, here, in the second formula, we still have some uh, inductive predicate. We can unfold this one, or we can unfold this one to get more formula and get more model and get more test input. Suppose in this example, we only have two. Uh, for the first formula, the server say that it is, it is certifiable and good should be now. 
For the second formula, again, the server say that it is certifiable, the root one to a node, and the left, left field and the right field, both of them should be now. So now we have the model, we can transform them into test input. So I did these two test input. The first test input, root here equal to now. The second test input, root one to a node, and the left in now and the right in now. And notice that there are, there are parameters that are not constrained by the recognition, such as S here. Remember that we need to we need a value for S also, right? So in this case, we can assign a default value for S. For example, we can default this, assign it the value zero here. Or if we want, we can assign a random value. It actually does not matter because we still have the second step in the generation um, process. So here, suppose that we, we assign the default value zero here to H. And uh, then with the two initial test input, we will execute them, and then we keep track of the execution in form of the execution tree. For example, with this first test input, when we execute, we will have this execution tree. It will follow the, the path that the t, t here equal to now. And after executing the second test input here, we have an updated execution tree. So it go this, go this way and this way. Yeah. So this is, this is what happened after the, the first step of our process. And now for the second step, we are ready for concrete execution. So in this step, we will check the execution tree, and then we will find the, the bar that are not deployed yet. And we show the accorded. Uh, you show the according bar condition to find the test input follow that bar. For example, in this case, we need to follow this bar, right? T equal to now, and S is less than T dot element. So we need to show this bar condition to find a test input follow this bar. So there is a small problem here. That is a bar condition may contain some few asset regression or few aside regression. So few asset regression, this is the form of T dot element here. And few assign regression, it may happen when we assign to some few of the node. The problem is the server cannot understand the regression. So we need to resolve them somehow. We need to transform the bar condition into a form that the server can understand. So our idea is this. If in the current bar condition, we, we know that S equal to now, that means S dot Fi here is not valid and we just simply discard the bar condition. If in the current bar condition, S is constrained by a predicate P, we unfold P to get the new constraint for S, and then we restart the process. If in the current bar condition, S bond to a node of type C, with this is the symbolic value for the node, we will write mapping for S field of the variable. And then for field asset regression, S dot Fi here, we simply substitute S dot Fi by Vi. But for few assigned regression, S dot Fi, here we will substitute S dot Fi by a red symbolic value, Vi cream. And then we substitute the assignment operator here with equality. And lastly, we update the mapping. So now S dot Fi born to Vi cream not VI anymore. So later, if we have another asset, S dot Fi, we know that we should substitute it with VI cream. So in, for an example, we are trying to solve this bad condition, right? So we have the, here the uh, precondition, and then this is T equal to root T, not equal to now, and S less than T dot element. We have the uh, few egress, few asset regression here that we need to resolve. So here we see that T equal to root, and root is constrained by binary tree predicate here. So we unfold the predicate. We get two new formula. In the first formula, root equal to now, T equal to root, so T dot element is not valid. We just simply discard this bar condition. For the second bar condition, root bond to a node, T equal to root, and so root dot element is the same as T dot element, and the symbolic value is ELT here. So we substitute T dot element with ELT, and we get the final bar condition. 
So ELT here, this one, the solver can understand this formula and it can check and it return that the formula is certifiable and it return a new model that we transform to a new test input. And when, after executing, executing that test input, we get an update execution, execution tree. Now if we want, we can continue to explore the tree to find the new execution path and generate new test input. Notice that here, in the execution, we never accept the left field and the right field of the root. However, the solver still returns the value for this field because they are constrained in the path condition here. So in the end, we still have the value for the field even if the field are never accepted in the execution. So that's why in the end, we get fully initialized test input instead of just partially initialized test input. So that's our idea, and we implement our approach in a road to time, and we perform several experiments for our approach. For the first experiment, we have 74 methods from several type of data structure here. And to validate the test input that we generate, we check the test input with the grab OK method in the data structure. So grab OK method is, is like some kind of invariant checker for a type of data structure. If the grab OK method returns true, that means the input satisfy the invariant of the data structure, otherwise it will return false. And for comparison, we compare our tool with uh, GBSE and PBE. So GBSE implement the head specification language which I introduced previously. And PBE, that means they perform lazy initialization on grab OK method to generate test input. And uh, for the result, first, on our generated test input certified grab OK. So the method grab OK return true for on our generated test input. And we get about 99% range coverage, especially for 70 over 74 methods, we get 100% range coverage. This includes auxiliary method. Uh, we miss some branches because uh, the server time out before it can return the model for the bad condition. And in some bad condition, there are native method gone, which is our cop of the server. So this is some result of ZBSE and PPE. So it uh, clearly show that uh, our approach is our form these tools. And for the average time, it's expected that we spend more time than PPE and ZBSE because we need to show the more complex path condition with inductive predicate to find the fully initialized test input. And this is the average number of solver count for each method. So this is the result of the first experiment. For the second experiment, we try to evaluate the youth unit of specification by stating step. So in this experiment, we conduct a 32 program as program travel a single unit and then call a different method from java.lang.mat. So it will apply some operation on the element value of the list. Uh, and because java.lang.mat, uh, the method in this library mostly uh, are native methods. So concrete execution uh, is useless because the server cannot understand the native method. So in this event, we only invoke the first step of our approach, the specification by stating step. And this is the result for the average range in COVID. We get about 88%. And this is the comparison for with the PPE. And for the time, we more or less spend the same time as PPE. So this shows that the, actually we need to spend more time in just a concrete testing is you, in a concrete execution step, in the best specification by stating step, we can, we, can, we can compare with other tools in terms of efficiency. 
And this is the average silver corn. We need to balance about 80 corns. So in this, in this experiment, we cannot compare with CBSE because we, we cannot find the head specification for single linear list. We do not know why. It may be because the, the head specification has some limited is resonant. It. For so this is the second experiment. So one one problem with our approach is we need the user to try the precondition in in terms of separation lucid formula, which is not an easy task. So in the third experiment, we try to combine our approach with some specification generation tools, and in this work we combine our tool with infer. So we use infer to generate the specification for HA method from let file project. So this is a uh, Baxter project. So the input need to satisfy some type of AST data structure property. And the result so that we can get about 58% grand score rate. And this is the average time and average server cost. So it's clearly not a good a um, manually written recognition, but it shows some potential combination. So to conclude, in this work, we propose an approach to generate test input for heap mobility program by combining separation logic and concrete execution. And the result so that our approach are performed as sitting one in some feature so that we can reduce invalid test input and we can get higher code coverage. Yeah, so that's all. So welcome everybody to this last talk in the session and thanks for being here despite the night w nice weather and uh, it almost being lunchtime. Uh, I will try not to forget to keep the mic close to my mouth so that you can understand me. Um, so uh, I'm at uh, Gothenburg University in Chalmers. We have a joint CS department and this is work that I did together with uh, Sherada Schneider who's also at Gothenburg University. Uh, with Cesar Sanchez at MDA Software and with uh, Borzo Bonaktarpur, who's uh, in, at Iowa uh, yeah, State University in, uh, in the US. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about hyper properties and in particular about a, a little case study that we did about a hyper property that's called distributed data minimality and sort of the trouble that we ran into uh, while we were doing this and then how we kind of fixed those problems that popped up. And if there's something that I would like to, 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 to remember from this talk, then it's this picture. So you can forget everything else uh, uh, after this picture, but this one you should remember. Uh, because this is kind of the conclusion uh, that we arrived at, is that monitorability is a bit more complex than we thought initially. So uh, in particular, we, uh, we realized that there's really different axes uh, of monitorability uh, or of, of systems, of properties, that determine whether or not you can monitor something. So usually, most of the work has been done in this corner down here. So these are just trace properties. LTL is used, and we know a lot about uh, monitoring LTL and trace properties. Um, but sometimes, you also want to use hyper properties, and that changes what you can and cannot monitor. Uh, so much is understood. There has been quite a lot of work on that as well. Uh, less than on trace properties, but still. And sometimes uh, you need to include some new, uh, information about your system uh, when you're doing monitoring, uh, because otherwise it's kind of uh, impossible to get anything interesting done, to get anything interesting monitored. And then this last uh, axis here is, uh, maybe it's kind of implicit, but we wanted to make it explicit is what happens when you consider properties over richer system, systems or richer logics where you can have predicates and other things, and, and suddenly computability of your monitor actually becomes an, an issue as well, okay? And as I said, the, the way we sort of ran into this is by trying to create a monitor for distributed data minimality. Now, what's distributed data minimality? It's a, um, a privacy property. Uh, it's uh, something that we, uh, that is inspired from the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. And um, distributed data minimality is a, 
generalization of data minimality as it's in the GDPR, uh, where you have a multi-input setting, so you have a system that doesn't just take inputs from one particular user, but maybe also for some, from some other system like a database or a cloud or something like that. Okay, it's a um, hyper property, meaning uh, it has both universal and existentially quantified traces. Um, it's not so important to look at this formula for now, but I just wanted to see that indeed we do have a for all, for all exists, exists here, and this makes things complicated. Uh, so the challenges in building a monitor for this is that according to the available theories about hyper properties and monitoring, this is not monitorable. Uh, we cannot monitor in a black box way. Uh, it's also an undecidable property. That's a, that's a bummer in general. And then uh, it's defined over arbitrary domains. So it depends on your system, right? Your domain could be, well, natural numbers for starters. And then it's hard to even define this property um, in, in sort of u the usual uh, subset of hyper LTL that one would consider. Yet, we have a monitor. So basically, we started this work by building this monitor, and it's sort of seeing how it fits into the existing framework. And so we were asking ourselves, what's going on? And so in the rest of the talk, I'm kind of trying to uh, uh, show you like where, why this is possible and what we had to modify in the existing framework. So I'm going to do that by sort of going along the axis of this uh, monitorability cube and sort of exploring what's there. And for a good part of the talk, I'm going to describe um, previous work. So, and that's basically because I don't know how many people in here are familiar with hyper properties. Actually, quick show of hands. So who knows LTL in here and monitoring runtime verification for LTL? Okay, quite a, yeah, I would say half of the people. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna maybe go a bit quickly over this particular part. Who knows something about hyper properties, hyper LTL? Okay, yeah, fewer people, but um, not, not nobody, that's good. All right, so let's start with LTL. Uh, so I'm going to use this example of coffee because we're at a conference and coffee is really important at conferences and coffee is really important in the life of a researcher, at least for me. Um, so here are my example uh, LTL properties. Uh, you have your classic safety property. There's always coffee. That is safety. There's also a lifeness prof property. Eventually there will be coffee. Okay, and then we have a recurrence property that says always eventually there will be coffee. So it might not be that we have coffee absolutely all the time, but when we run out of coffee, at least we will have coffee again later. Okay, so here are possible um, evolu evolutions of the world, possible traces. In the first sort of perfect world, there's always coffee, right, at infinitum. And at that point, the first uh, property here, the safety property is fulfilled. So um, it is true that there's always coffee. But there's also a second a trace here of the world where we ran out of coffee very quickly. And at this point, uh, the safety property is, is violated, but the, the lifeness property is still true because there was a point where we had coffee, so eventually there was coffee. Um, and the last trace is sort of a mix of the two, so we period periodically get coffee and then we run out of coffee and then we get coffee again. And here it's... Uh, the, uh, the lifeness property is obviously still true because at least at some points there's coffee, but also the, um, the recurrence property is true, which wasn't the case here because we ran out of coffee indefinitely, okay? So that's the sort of uh, properties we're interested in, and uh, there's, a, of course, a formal semantics of, uh, of LTL in terms of Kripke models, and uh, I'm not gonna go into that, that is well known. And the question is now, how do we monitor these type of, of oops, sorry about that, of these properties. What does it mean to monitor um, a, a, such a property? Well, if we uh, come out of the first session at the conference at 10 o'clock and it's the coffee break, we might find this state of the world or this history of the morning. Okay, there's been coffee all morning. Everybody's happy. But then after the coffee break, the world might look like this. So now we have uh, run out of coffee because the coffee break is over. And these are finite observations. These are finite prefixes of infinite traces. And we would like to say something about these properties even though we only have these finite observations. Okay, so um, we would like to answer the, co the question, is there always coffee? And after the first observation, we can't uh, definitively say that there will always be coffee because we don't know the future that we, we might run out of coffee. So, so far it is true. 
but in the future, we don't know. So we have to say, we don't know. Now, after the second observation, we know more about the world, and now we can definitively say, no, there's not always coffee, okay? So this property has been violated, even though we've only observed the finite amount of, of the world, basically, a finite history of the world. Now, for the uh, liveness properties, actually, we can already, at the beginning, confidently say there's eventually coffee, because we have observed coffee. We have all the proof we need. In every future extension of this, uh, of this history, there was coffee, and so we're good. Uh, for the recurrence property, hello, whoops, too fast. For the recurrence property, we can actually not give a verdict given these two observations. Because it could be here that there will eventually always be coffee again, but it could also be that there will never be any more coffee after this, and so we, we can say neither yes nor yo, uh, yes nor no. All right. So this is monitoring. Monitoring is to decide, given a property, whether uh, it will always hold or it, it will always um, f uh, fail in the future, uh, will always be satisfied, always be violated, or neither. Sometimes we sim simply cannot say. And um, what, what it means to do that at runtime is we need to be able to do that for finite observations. All right, so we can make this again more precise, and the way to make it more precise is to talk about permanent satisfaction and permanent violation, meaning any future extension of the current ob observation uh, satisfies, respectively violates the property. Okay, then we say it's permanently satisfies or violated, and uh, in this particular case here, we can say that the safety property is, um, is not permanently uh, satisfied uh, it is permanently violated, and uh, similarly for the other two properties, and we can see here that for the recurrence property, it's neither permanently satisfied nor permanently violated. That's why we say, I don't know. Okay, so that's monitoring, and now what is a monitor? Well, a monitor is a function, a computable function, that, that does exactly that, that gives these verdicts given current observations about the world. And so um, a monitor may be sound uh, if it always gives the, uh, if, if the world always behaves in the way that the monitor says it behaves, we definitely want monitors to be sound. And we do also like them to be complete, meaning when they say, um, uh, when, when there is actually something true about the world, when we uh, permanently satisfy a property, the monitor will always say so. The monitor could also just always say, I don't know. That monitor would be sound, but it would not be complete. Okay, so ideally what we want is complete monitors. So that's kind of going to the decidability thing that comes later. All right, and we have a fact. For every LTL formula, we can actually create a perfect, so a sound and complete monitor, and so that's very nice about LTL. All right, now, even though we can always construct these monitors, um, it doesn't always make sense to do so. So for example, we saw this uh, recurrence property here, and uh, we already noticed that for this particular uh, history of the world, we can't definitely say that it violates or satisfies the property. And in fact, we can never do that. So for this particular property, even though we can construct a monitor, the monitor will just always say, I don't know. So there's no point in monitoring this property, okay? And this is what this notion of monitorability captures. So the notion of monitorability tells you whether or not it makes sense to construct a monitor. This is the notion due to Newelli and Sachs. All right, okay, so to summarize this, so this was LTL, uh, and to summarize, uh, LTL properties are properties defined over individual traces. That means that every LTL property characterizes a set of traces. Um, we can have sound and complete monitors, we call these perfect monitors, for any property by a, a Bushi automata. Um, at, that does not mean, just because we have monitors, does not mean that every formula is monitorable. So safety and liveness properties typically are, recurrence properties are not. And there's been tons of work on this, so I only listed uh, a few uh, papers here that we cite in the, in the paper, but if you're inter interested, then have a look at the paper and, and uh, we give a little overview there as well. Okay, so now we're going go hyper. Okay, so far we've only looked at trace properties. Now we're making things a bit more interesting and we're going to hyper properties. What is a hyper property? Well, going back to our coffee analogy, um, so there might not be only one conference track or not only one conference venue. So here, for example, we have this one and then the other one at the hotel and then one at the uh, World of Discovery. 
And now we might ask ourselves questions like, is there always coffee everywhere at the same time? So if we have coffee here, do the guys over there also have coffee? And that's maybe hard to enforce, but uh, at least we are hoping for this sort of alternating property here. So if the coffee runs out here, then hopefully there's another place we can go to where there will be coffee, okay? So you can see this is a universally quantified uh, property, and this one is one with a, call, uh, with a quantifier alternation. All right, and then the states of the world now are not just individual traces, but they're actually sets of traces. So again, uh, we might have this uh, singleton set that just has the perfect world in it, where there's always coffee, but we can also have uh, multiple sets, so if there are multiple tracks of the conference, and some of them might have coffee in the beginning and there's no more, and in some cases maybe the people providing the coffee were a bit late, and yeah. And there would be these sort of infinite sets of traces as well. So this would be the infinite set of traces where there's the, in the first trace, there's only coffee at, for one step. In the second trace, there's coffee for two steps and so on. Uh, and uh, if we again look at sort of what's satisfied and, uh, and violated, then the, the, the perfect world here satisfies both of these properties. The, the second world here, um, violates the, the first property, that there's coffee always everywhere at the same time, because obviously there's not. And then this third set, which is infinitely large, it uh, violates both of these uh, properties, because, uh, well, for the first one it's maybe obvious, but for the second one, we don't know that there is potentially not a trace um, where there's always coffee, because there's always only a finite time that there has been coffee, right? And we would need a trace where there's an infinite time where there is coffee. I'll come back to this. All right, and again, um, we can make this more precise. Uh, there's a semantics. I have a look at the paper. This is all well known. Uh, this is not something we developed. Um, okay, so when we want to monitor hyper LTL, the idea, the basic idea is the same, okay? So we have observations. These observations are finite, but now they're finite not just in time, so finite traces, but they're also finite as sets, okay? So the world at 10 might look this way. There's coffee in this one place, but at 11, we know more about the world. We now know about a second track that has started, and, and the coffee situation there looks different. And it might even be that uh, we have a, a third world where the, the, the track hasn't been going on for as long time as the others, so there might actually be a difference also in the size of the traces, okay? And then there might be... Uh, uh, more and more traces joining this, this set. But always, there's always going to be a finite set of finite traces. And then we are trying to answer similar questions as for the non-hyper case. So is there always coffee everywhere at the same time? And uh, in this particular case, we actually don't know about uh, even, uh, well, we don't know for the, certainly for the first uh, observation. We can again violate the second observation because we see that indeed we have a pair of traces here that are a counterexample. Um, but for the second property, we again have this, uh, this problem that we can't say a priori whether it's always going to be true given just these finite observations, okay? So we play the same game. Uh, so monitoring hyper-LTL will be to, uh, given a finite observations, so a finite set of finite traces, we have to make this decision. Uh, and we can extend the previous definition of permanent satisfaction and permanent violation quite easily to this uh, hyper setting. And uh, we can then evaluate uh, traces for permanent satisfaction or permanent violation just as we did with, with, uh, uh, with uh, trace properties. All right, and here again we notice that this uh, quantifier alternation formula here doesn't seem to be either satisfied or violated permanently. So. Mm. Okay, so let's have a little closer look at that. Uh, well, it seems that we have a similar problem as with the uh, recurrence property before. It's just we don't know enough about the future state of the world to be able to decide that it's permanently violated or satisfied. And in fact, there's a similar observation to the previous case that for this particular formula, it will never be the case that we can decide this because we just never know enough about the world. And so there's no point in monitoring this alternating formula. And again, one can define then a notion of monitorability that captures this um, where uh, you're saying, well, a formula is semantically monitorable. Uh, if, we, if every current um, 
state of the world can be extended to one where we can actually say that something that the property is permanently violated or permanently satisfied. All right. Okay. Seems fair enough. So this is uh, the summary about hyper-LTL. Uh, we now have properties that describe sets of traces, or that are defined over sets of traces, so they describe sets of sets of traces. And uh, there are sound and complete monitors for some formulas. Uh, for example, if we don't have qualifier alternations, we can also uh, build automatopathies. Um, and we have uh, some uh, cases where it's kind of unclear whether we can do it or not. Um, not all uh, formulas are monitorable. In fact, most are not, and I'll come back to that. And there has been some previous work, and there was a, actually a very nice um, a tutorial uh, at RV this, uh, this week. So if you could travel back to time, I would recommend that you would go to the tutorial, but uh, you can at least uh, read the tutorial paper. I think it was a, a very nice overview of all of this. All right, okay, so now let's talk about things that we did. All right, so we're going now to the case where we distinguish here between black and gray box monitoring. So what do I mean by that? Okay, so let's go back to this alternating uh, hyper property. And I said observation, this is not monitorable, um, but I didn't quite tell you why or how I know this. So there's a little theorem here, and it says that, um, you know, given this formula um, and any uh, finite observation, it's actually neither permanently satisfied nor permanently violated, which means in particular we can never extend finite observations uh, to, uh, uh, to be either permanently satisfied or, or violated. Okay, here's the proof. So for the permanent violation, the counterexample is the, um, the set of traces that contains all the traces. And in particular, it contains this trace where there's always coffee so we cannot violate this formula because this is a, there is a world, strictly speaking, where there is always coffee. And uh, for permanent satisfaction, uh, sorry, permanent, yeah, permanent satisfaction, here we can build counterexamples. So if you give me any finite world, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pad that finite observation with no coffee, with infinite no coffee extensions. Okay, and at that point, um, this uh, this violates the property, and so there can never be. Uh, uh, this can never be permanently satisfied. All right, so this little proof about this very specific case can be generalized to a proof, yeah, to a proof um, where you have uh, formulas of this sort. So there's a, a quantifier alternation, and then you have some sort of a propositional predicate here uh, with two traces that appear, and this has to be a binary predicate. It has to be serial and non-reflexive, and if that's the case, then we can prove this sort of um, uh, theorem more generally. All right. Okay. So let's have a closer look at this proof. This is somewhat dubious. It's a bit silly. So I'm disproving this because I'm saying, well, there is a, a world uh, of infinite, and with an infinite number of traces, and, it, and all of these traces are infinitely long, and one of them happens to be the trace where there's always coffee. But this is not how the world works. Realistic systems do not have realize every possible trace. Uh, th there's not an infinite number of coffee dispensers in the world, sadly. Um, so although this is formally speaking a proof that this formula is not monitorable, it's, it's debatable whether this is very useful as a proof. So what we would like to do when we're monitoring hyperproperties is that we would like to take into account some information about the system. Like, for example, there's only a finite number of coffee dispensers, okay? So um, this is what we call gray box monitoring. So we can adjust this definition of permanent satisfaction and permanent violation by introducing something that we call a system. And what's a system? A system is just a, a subset of all the possible um, sets of traces that we, that that we have, and those are the ones that are actually valid that the system can generate. Okay, so then we can, gen we can generalize this definition quite easily by introducing this, this particular notion of a system, and instead of quantifying over all possible uh, worlds, we're just quantifying over those that actually make sense. All right, and now uh, for this particular example, for, we could impose a system that says we have at least, or we have at most three worlds that we're looking at the same time, and when we do that, then according to this specification now, we can actually say that this can be violated. 
because uh, with only three worlds, uh, there's no way that I, I can extend this now uh, in order for this, this formula to hold. Okay, so again, it's a kind of a silly example, but we'll see more realistic ones. Okay, and uh, I introduced this now for hyper-LTL, but really this idea of having a system of valid behaviors is a, is a general idea that you can also use for trace properties or for any sort of um, temporal properties or even non-temporal properties that you will like. So you can easily generalize this, this uh, idea of um, permanent satisfaction and violation to other settings by adjusting sort of your set of possible observables and your uh, set of possible behaviors and taking the system uh, behaviors to be a subset of that. So that's just a generalization. And then we say that the formula is semantically gray box monitorable for the particular system. If in that system uh, we can either, uh, there, there is always an extension that is either permanently satisfied or permanently violated. Okay. All right, so now, that we have this more uh, refined notion of monitorability. The question is, can we actually build monitors? And the, um, the general principle that we're sort of proposing in this paper is that when you have system information, you can use that system information to produce monitors uh, as follows. So assuming you have some sort of a, a, a property that looks of this sort, so for all exists, and then some formula depends on these, uh, these two, and we're going to use the information that S gives us. In this particular example, we're going to use the information that there's only a finite number of traces. Uh, this is the formula that we have. We start by negating it because we're trying to find violations. We instantiate the first quantifier with traces that we have observed thus far, and we, inst we solve the second quantifier, and that's the important part, we solve that um, with the, given the, the extra information that the system provides. So here we need to do some sort of static analysis. This is not um, just uh, instantiating, it's not just automata anymore. Okay, and then if we do that, we can uh, actually decide uh, some properties like this. All right, so that's the summary for about gray box monitoring. I'm gonna skip over that so I can say at least one word about the um, the actual system that we applied this to. So there's also a dimension that's undecidability. I'm going to skip over that. It's basically just that for some systems, uh, we cannot build um, perfect monitors because we can't decide the properties. And that's basically what this says. Whoop. So uh, there was a nice keynote uh, on Tuesday by David Basin uh, about uh, GDPR compliance and whether or not we can uh, verify it at runtime. And he pointed out, uh, among other things, that there is a problem here with data minimality because, uh, as he said, not fin finitely fal falsifiable. So this comes back to this sort of, we need system information uh, in order to decide these sort of properties. Okay, so remember this was sort of the slide that I started from. And I said the challenges were it's not black box monitorable, it's undecidable, and it's defined over arbitrary data types. Uh, Yet yeah, we have a monitor, here's how we did it. By now you can guess it because you saw sort of the, the refinement. Uh, so this is the definition of data minimality that we're using. We're expressing it as a hyper property. We're also using this uh, system specification here that says we can actually only observe valid behaviors, so those that are generated by the system. Um, then we, we pick this observable. It's not black box monitorable but it is gray box monitorable thanks to the system. And uh, the monitor that we built uh, uses that information, so I'm gonna skip over the details, uh, by uh, internally using this oracle here which is implemented as a uh, symbolic execution engine plus a SAT solver that actually instantiates this inner existential quantifier. And this does not lead to a complete monitor, but it leads to a sound monitor um, because the property is undecidable, so we could not, in principle, even create a, a complete monitor. All right, and we've actually implemented this. You can look at the code. Uh, you can try it out. Um, the reason why there's this ice cream here is because ice cream is, goes well with coffee, and also our tool is called Minion. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and sorry that went over time. And I'd like to call, uh, thank my collaborators who are here in the audience, and uh, if you have any questions, I will take them now. Thank you. <laughs>